Um, okay, yeah, without further ado, I'll let him take it away. All right, thanks, Andrew. Um, thanks everyone for inviting me here. Um, it's, um, it's great to have the opportunity to talk to people that I think will, you know, have interesting things to say about um, the topic I'm going to um, present today. Um, so yeah, diffusion is something you expect um in generic systems but not necessarily in integrable systems um why don't you expect diffusion in integrable systems well um what's integrability um it's um basically a property of um the kinematics of one-dimensional collisions so if you have trolleys in a frictionless track um they come in um to two-body collision with two unknowns initially um with two with two initial velocities the two unknowns, the two final velocities, and there are two constraints fixing them. And so if you come in with a pair of initial velocities, the only things that the trolleys can do is exchange their velocities. And therefore the set of velocities is conserved under two body collisions. All that can happen is the trolleys can permute which trolley has which velocity. Um, and so this means that, um, that this distribution of velocities doesn't relax. And that sense, the model doesn't thermalize um, and, um, and is integrable. Um, three body collisions generically break this feature, um, but in many models of interest, like the Heisenberg and Hubbard models, they don't, and so the model is integrable and this trolley picture works, um, you know, even at finite densities. Um, this, of course, is not how generic scattering works in dimensions greater than one, and so you don't really have non-trivial integrable systems um, in dimensions greater than one. Okay, so um, as you've all probably um, heard at some point or other, integrable systems are exactly solvable, um, but this exact solvability comes with a bit of an asterisk, um, because what the exact solution that the beta Ansatz gives you is um, a set of, um, it, 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 it gives you the energies of the eigenstates in terms of um, the occupation numbers of these um, somewhat fictitious quasi-particles. Um, and, um, and so as long as you're dealing with the eigenvalues, the energies, um, and that's all you need, for example, for the thermodynamics, um, then you're in, you're in business because, um, because all you need to do is you need to work with the quasi-particles, and that's easy. On the other hand, if you ever need to compute um, the transformation between physical particles and quasi-particles, that's to say, if you ever need to deal with the eigenvectors and some basis, or to compute the matrix elements of physical operators among um, beta Ramsatz eigenstates, then you're in um, a lot of trouble because, um, because these things are really nasty. And so that makes it very difficult to um, express something like the Kubo formula for a conductivity in terms of, um, in terms of beta Ansatz data. And that, that's why people didn't figure these problems out um, back in the 60s and 70s. So um, the recent advance in this field um, came from finding a clever way to re-express um, all this hard stuff in terms of the easy stuff. And, um, and that, in fact, um, amounts to going um, from the sort of um, nasty um, um, set of expressions, matrix elements, to, um, to um, returning to this simple picture of trolleys in a track. And I'll very quickly outline how that works because it's going to be important um, downstream in this talk. Okay, so the idea is something like the following. So you take your system and you chop it up into a bunch of little blocks um, and each block is called a hydrodynamic cell. And you assume these blocks are very big compared to any microscopic scale um, in the system. And, um, and so um, you say each, um, if the cells are big enough, um, then um, there's a process where um, each cell approaches some kind of steady state um, that's specified by um, some local generalized thermal state with a lot of Lagrange multipliers for each of the conserved quantities in the integrable system. And, um, and so um, now what you, what you have is your initial condition, let's say you're trying to compute transport. So maybe your initial condition has a slight excess of density um, in the cells near the middle of your system um, and, um, and the density falls off as you go away from the middle of the system. So um, what you now need instead of solving the full beta runs, that's you need some way of talking about how um, these generalized thermal um, distributions evolve um, 
under under time evolution. And so this is given by um, by the the approach to generalized hydrodynamics, um, and um, and basically says, okay, all that happens um, under time evolution is that your quasi particles um, go from one cell to the next. Um, how do they do that? Well, they move ballistically with um, a group velocity um, that's set by um, that's set by the simple part of the beta ansatz because the group velocity is sort of a property of um, of 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 how um, of of the of the quasi particle dispersion. It has nothing to do with the relation between quasi particles and physical particles. And so you can assign a group velocity to a quasi particle. You can also assign a um, dressed charge or a dressed um, energy to a quasi particle. That again depends on um, on the the background state the quasi particle is moving above. And that's that's all stuff you can get from just computing um, thermodynamic beta ansatz data. And so what you do is you compute a time evolution for um, you compute the time evolution of the quasi particle distribution function, and then at the end of the day you have um, in each cell some quasi particle distribution, and you back out um, you back out say um, the the total charge in the cell from the quasi particle distribution because that again computing the expectation values of conserved charges is simple to do thermodynamically because you can attach chemical potentials to them and take derivatives respect to the chemical potentials. So you only ever have to do um, thermodynamics. You don't need matrix elements. So that's that's the basic strategy um, that um, is um, that's involved in, in generalized hydrodynamics. And what does it buy you? Well, it buys you that um, instead of computing the dynamics of, of um, some complicated physical object, you just need to compute how these quasi particles move around the system. Now, what are quasi particles in the trolley picture? Um, you might think that the naive notion of a quasi particle is a single trolley, but in fact, um, a bit of thought will make you realize that um, keeping track of single trolley um, velocity is the terrible way to do the bookkeeping because each time a trolley collides with another trolley, its velocity is effectively randomized. A much better way to do the bookkeeping is to keep track of um, of, of, of the trolley with velocity v. You, you want to define that to be a quasi particle. And so that quasi particle just um, moves ballistically to the system, and each time there's a collision, that um, that object um, jitters a bit, and um, and so that jittering um, gives you both, on average, a renormalization to velocity, um, and it also gives you, um, if you treat it more seriously, subleading corrections that give you diffusive corrections to hydrodynamics. So anyways, that's that's the picture. So now we um, we've reduced our general integrable system to um, to to a system with trolleys, um, you know, moving around on a frictionless track, and um, and the and all that we need the beta ansatz for is to give us um, the properties of each trolley, like the charge it carries, and so on. Okay, um, and um, and so um, one question that might emerge from um, this description as well. Okay, you know, obviously everything is going every, every dynamical thing in an integrable system is going to be ballistic. So can you get behavior that's non-ballistic in an integrable system? And um, and the surprise at some level is that you <coughs> do. Um, sorry, you have a question. Um, I should say, please do interrupt me as I as I'm speaking. If you do have questions, don't don't raise your hand or do something like that because I wouldn't be able to see that. Okay, so in the simplest um, integrable system, you could write down and study numerically, which is the XXZ spin chain. Um, you find that in fact spin transport is not always ballistic, even though energy transport is always ballistic. Um, in fact, as you tune this parameter, which is the anisotropy. Um, spin transport goes from being ballistic to being diffusive um, with this um, intermediate um, and very interesting critical point that I won't say very much about today. Um, interestingly, this, um, this transition in the spin transport um, seems to coincide with a zero temperature transition in the nature of the ground state of the system. The ground state goes from being gapless um, and having a continuous symmetry and breaking continuous symmetry to being gapped and breaking a discrete Ising symmetry. 
um, at the phase transition. And you might say, well, okay, there's a zero temperature phase transition. Um, and, um, and so that's, that's very interesting, but you know, it's one dimension. So any finite temperature should get rid of this phase transition. So why do you see any vestige of it in the high temperature dynamics? So that's one question you might ask. Another question you might ask is, um, is, is, is the one that I um, already asked, which is how can an integral system fail to have ballistic transport? So these questions have been floating around for about a decade now. And um, in the past couple of years, we've gotten um, a pretty good handle on, um, on most of what happens this phase diagram. Um, and, um, and so um, I won't really be talking about this in general, but let me just um, um, flash the answer to, um, to this question of why you can have phase transitions at finite temperature in one dimension. And the basic answer is something like this. Um, an integral system, um, you can create a finite energy density state by beginning of the ground state and then stacking excitations on top of it. Now, if the system were chaotic, the excitations would disintegrate, they would sort of thermalize and you'd get some kind of um, featureless soup. And the notion of what an elementary excitation is would cease to be well-defined once you're away from zero temperature. An integral system though, these excitations can't decay so they remain stable, even though they're highly normalized, even if um, you're in a high temperature state. And so in that sense, um, a change in the ground state, a, change, a phase transition in the ground state, which corresponds to change in the elementary excitation spectrum, can also sort of infect um, high temperature states because the elementary excitations just remain in the spectrum at all temperatures. They're just present at finite density and high temperature states. So that's um, heuristically what the answer to this question is. And in the rest of this talk, I'm going to um, try and be more detailed about um, how this plays out um, in, um, in the, the limit, in the most tractable limitless model, which is the limit of, um, of anisotropies um, bigger than one. Um, and I'll normally assume um, that I'm talking about anisotropies much bigger than one, but I claim that um, whatever I'm saying is true whenever um, there is any easy access and isotropy at all. Can I ask and a so question? Talking... Yeah, go ahead. So, um, so if you were to plot the, you know, the, the phase diagram in terms of the anisotropy and temperature. Yeah. So your statement is that this transition you have at the Heisenberg point still exists as a singularity into, in, into finite temperature. It, it exists it, it exists a singularity in transport even though thermodynamics does not see it that's right and it's a oh, vertical yeah. it's a vertical phase boundary the partition sum doesn't see it you say that is correct you only the see partition the sum does not see it none of the thermodynamic expectation values see it because we're talking about a finite temperature system in one dimension yeah that's what okay but you see it in transport that's a statement okay that's thanks a statement. Yeah. So, so what exactly uh, do you uh, mean by a phase transition in this case? Um, what I mean, um, oh, I shouldn't have deleted that slide. Um, what I mean is that if you take the Kubo formula and you take um, um, the infinite time limit, the Kubo formula, um, that, that changes in a singular, in fact, discontinuous way across, actually, no, it's not discontinuous, but it's, it's singular across the transition. So you take L to infinity, then you take T to infinity. Yeah, you take L to infinity, then you take T to infinity. That's right. Okay, thanks. Um, that's that's the correct order of limits. Um, so yeah, you have to take because you're yeah. You, you, if you like, um, your transport calculation involves um, dealing with a um, sort of um, a square tensor network, roughly speaking, and um, and so the the system must become big enough that the the tensor network never hits the edge for this to work. Okay, um, I see a question in the chat. Um, so um, yeah, there's indeed no um, singularity in any thermodynamic functions. Um, please don't put questions in the chat because I'm not gonna see them there. Please just interrupt me. Okay, so in the rest of this talk, um, I wanna cover um, three aspects of, um, I, well, I wanna overview, I wanna give you an overview of why there's diffusion and then I want to talk about um, three ways in which this diffusion is very strange um, compared to what you normally expect in a diffusive many-body system, like, for example, 
I don't know, chaotic spin chain or uh, an exclusion process. Okay, so um, let me give you a quick um, um, argument as to why there's no ballistic transport in the system. Um, and I'll focus for now on what happens at infinite anisotropy. Um, at infinite anisotropy, what happens is that um, if I go back to um, what this Hamiltonian is, um, this term acts as a hard kinetic constraint. And what it says is that um, you cannot change the total number of domain walls because that would cost you infinite amounts of energy. At the same time, this model has the U1 symmetry and the U1 symmetry tells you you cannot change um, the total number of upspins either. So domains can't do what they do in the Ising model where they grow and shrink um, but they, because of U1, but they also can't move around um, easily because um, you know they can't sort of they can't pull um, a bit off and the rest can't follow it because that would involve an intermediate step that was infinitely energetically suppressed. So what happens in this limit of infinite delta is that um, your problem consists of two types of objects. You have magnons, um, which are these single minority spins, um, um, which are mobile because um, there's no problem moving it around. Um, you don't change the number of domain walls when you do that. Um, and then you have everything else and everything else is frozen. Um, and, um, and so the, the non-trivial dynamical thing that happens in this model is what happens when a magnon um, encounters a domain. And so that's what I've illustrated um, over here. So your magnon comes in um, and it sees this frozen domain. It doesn't really do anything until it almost comes up to the edge of the domain. At this point, um, it needs to figure out what to do next. Well, it can't just keep moving naively because in that case it would destroy two domain walls. That's forbidden. Um, so the only things it can do is either bounce back out um, or it can transmit um, through the uh, domain, but in the process of transmitting through the domain, it loses its um, polarity. So it comes in as a black spin in a white domain and it transmits through as a white spin in a black domain and it pops out the other side and it, it returns to being a black spin in a white domain. So this, this process effectively does two things. The first thing it does is it depolarizes the magnons. Um, so if you're, in a, if you're in a state with an equal number of up and down domains, um, then on average, um, your magnon's carrying no spin. And so that's why there's no ballistic spin transport in this regime. Um, and the second thing that happens is that um, the big domains, big frozen domains undergo Brownian motion um, as they keep getting hit by small domains from either side. Because each time a collision like this happens, you see the big domain has moved um, over by two sites in the opposite direction to the magnon. So those are the two basic phenomena. So the first phenomenon gives you an absence of ballistic transport. Um, and the second phenomenon gives you diffusion because these big domains um, are not demagnetized, but they're undergoing Brownian motion. Okay. So that's um, that's the origin of diffusion in this, um, in this system. Um, and there's a nice intuitive way to compute the diffusion constant. And the argument is as follows. Um, so your magnon, in a, when it transmits through a region of size, when it, when it travels for a time t, it sees a region of, of size proportional to the time it's traveled. And in that region, the positive and negative domains don't cancel out exactly. There's an excess of positive domains that's sort of um, one over square root of t um, by central limiting arguments. And so the magnon isn't perfectly depolarized. It carries magnetization that's one over square root of t. And so if you ask what's the transport associated with that, well, it's the charge. It's the charge squared times the distance traveled squared. And um, so it travels ballistically. So that's, that's this um, numerator. But then it's also getting depolarized as it travels. And that's this denominator. And they cancel out to give you, ballistic, to, to give you diffusive transport of spin in this model. And so this, this, this argument, um, somewhat surprisingly, um, continues to work um, at finite um, delta. So at finite anisotropy, um, you don't just have magnons, you have magnons, and then you have things that move at second order in perturbation theory and things that move at third order in perturbation theory and so on. But um, the separation of scales between each of those processes, and so it's natural to, to treat them all hierarchically. And if you do that, um, you get some exact closed form expression for the diffusion constant and the infinite temperature limit. And so that's that's what happens um, 
at the level of linear response, you get diffusion and the diffusion constant diverges with some critical exponent as you approach um, the um, as you approach the Heisenberg point. Okay, so any questions about that? All right. If not, let me keep going. Um, and um, and so so this this looks like all you have in this model is diffusion. Um, but what I'm going to talk about now is a number of ways in which um, the transport of this model is not regular diffusion. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is what happens if you're um, if you're away from half filling. Um, that's to say, if you have let's say a net magnetic field. Um, the way you want to think about it maybe is not so much a net magnetic field, but a net imbalance between up and down spins. Because remember that you run the total number of upspins is conserved. And so if you start an initial state that's mostly spin polarized, um, it's going to stay spin polarized forever. So, um, so you can think about it, it's just a different sector of, um, of, of the Hamiltonian. Okay, so now let's begin by talking about what happens um, in a sector of the problem um, with a large net polarization. So most of your spins are down and there's some small fraction F that are up. And, um, and so most of those um, upspins are single upspins in a sea of down because that's the most common thing that can happen. But then of course, with some probability F cubed, you're gonna have um, three upspins next to each other. And so in general, you're, you're, going, you're going to have this dilute gas of, um, of, of up um, domains of size n, um, those are exponentially suppressed in n. Now, the, the other thing, so that's, that's one point to notice. The other point to notice is that, um, that these, these objects of size n can only move at nth order in perturbation theory. So the characteristic velocity associated with them is also exponentially suppressed in n. And so if you try and write down an expression for the spin correlation function, for the spin structure factor, um, what you'll say is that, okay, so you begin with, um, you begin with um, an upspin at, um, at the origin and you ask, um, what's, the, um, what's, the, what's the probability that's made it out to some, um, to some distance n at some time t? And then um, that's a sum over all of these guys and the velocities they're traveling at. So if you look at this picture, um, the lightest, um, the lightest um, color is for the magnons, which have traveled the farthest. And then the next guys have traveled a lot less far. And then um, the, the darker and darker colors correspond to um, bigger and bigger clumps of magnons, which um, are almost immobile. Um, and so you can um, perform the sum and you find the sum has two regimes, depending on whether, um, whether the smallness of F or the slowness of Delta wins. Um, and, um, and so if the smallness of F wins, then um, you don't care about these um, higher clumps because they're too rare. And then your autocorrelation function um, at, um, at short distances and late times just goes ballistically as one over T. On the other hand, if, um, if delta wins, you keep f fixed and you take delta v very large, um, then naively at least this gives you an anomalous um, exponent um, for, um, for the, the probability of seeing an upspin at the origin of late time if you saw it there in early time. So um, your transport, this part of your structure factor is dominated by, um, by, very heavy, by very heavy clumps that don't move at all, these big strings of, um, of upspins. Now, what I wrote down here is not quite accurate because I didn't include, I, I treated the upspin, I treated the big clumps as completely frozen. In fact, they're not completely frozen because as I discussed in previous slides, um, they, um, they jitter because they're collisions with the not so rare magnons. And so once you include that, what you find is that um, there's actually a, um, there's actually a different anomalous exponent um, that, um, that, 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 that actually is diffusive in the limit. It approaches diffusion in the limit, delta goes to infinity, but otherwise it's not quite diffusive. Um, so if you're working at finite um, delta and finite um, magnetization, um, the upshot of all of these things is that you find that you have um, some transport some spin is carried ballistically by the by your light objects, but um, but a lot of it just sits around um, around the origin because it's carried by 
um, by heavy clumps that are essentially immobile, except for diffusive um, motion. So yes, yeah, so you, you have this phase transition in the in the local autocorrelation function um, as you um, as you change um, the filling, and um, and so the half filling point is always in the phase where um, the the local autocorrelation function is um, is anomalous, and um, it's anomalous with this um, with this exponent. So um, you also see this um, in in numerics, and this is what the structure factor looks like um, at finite. Um, at finite magnetization. So you have these wings um, that um, carry spin out ballistically, but then most, as you go towards half filling, most of the spin remains near the origin and this diffuse blob, and this diffuse blob um, relaxes um, with an anomalous exponent that is continuously varying um, with um, the magnetization. As you take the magnetization, the net magnetization to zero, this blob becomes um, strictly diffusive, and then these um, wings um, lose all their intensity, and so all you have is a purely diffusive structure factor. So the sense in which this is unusual is that normally you take a diffusive system and you do a little bit, like you apply a small magnetic field to it, it remains diffusive. But this diffusion um, stops being diffusive the moment you apply a small net magnetization. And so in that sense, it's already beginning to look a little unusual. So that, that's um, historically the earliest um, calculation we did to show that, um, that diffusion in this model looks kind of weird. Um, so if, let, me, let me pause momentarily for questions. And if there aren't any, I'll keep going. All right, so um, now let me talk about what happens when you remain at half filling, um, that's the infinite temperature state, but you break integrability. So um, studying models with broken integrability is difficult, as you all know, because um, doing um, numerical simulations and chaotic systems is difficult. Um, but one rather numerically efficient way to break integrability is um, is to add noise to the system. Um, so in the presence of noise, so you can add noise, that's white noise that couples to whatever operator you like in your system. Um, and by choosing what this operator is, you can either um, preserve or destroy various symmetries. So the key thing about this is that even though a single noise realization is very hard to simulate numerically, um, the physics, the dynamics averaged over noise is simple because if you perform the noise average, that gives you a Lindblad form master equation, and um, and Lindblad form master equations have um, limited um, entanglement growth, and um, and so that allows you to carry out the simulation to relatively long times. And so um, the results I'm going to present are mostly for noise, but I'll also I'll also show you Hamiltonian results. Um, they're qualitatively similar, but the data quality is worse because you can't converge them out to late times. Okay, so given what I told you about why diffusion arises in this model, um, you might say, well, okay, what happens when you um, break integrability? And there are two apparently contradictory answers to that that both make some amount of sense. One of them is the boring answer that just says, okay, the model is already diffusive. Um, if you break integrability in a normal integrable model, um, you're going to give it like free fermions, you're going to give your free fermions a mean free path, and that's going to give you diffusion. On the other hand, here we're already diffusive, so what else can happen? Um, you're just going to change the diffusion constant by a bit. The second thing you might say, based on our arguments from um, the previous slides, is, you know, why is there diffusion in the system at the outset? Well, basically because um, you have ballistically moving magnons and they approximately depolarize. See, it's this cancellation between the ballistic motion and the approximate depolarization that gives you diffusion. Now, if you take that picture seriously um, and, um, and you say, okay, let me just give these magnons a mean free path, then what you immediately find is that um, instead of diffusion, you get subdiffusion. Um, and, um, and so, um, you know, what, what do you see numerically? Well, what you see numerically is that you see um, a sort of weird combination of both these results. Um, you see subdiffusion 
for some um, parametrically large time scale that's controlled by the anisotropy, but at asymptotically late times, you get diffusion, but the diffusion constant asymptotically late times is totally unrelated to the diffusion constant in the integral system. So as so you I'm take, red... I... yeah, go ahead. Uh, sorry, uh, so delta is anisotropy, but can you remind us what gamma is? Yeah, sorry, gamma is the strength of um, integrability breaking. And uh, how do you break it here? Um, I break it, like I said in the previous slide, I break integrability by adding noise to the system. So, so what this, is this is some random variable eta, and I guess the variance of eta, the standard deviation of eta is gamma. And so what you do is, you, you know, you, you take this noise and then you average over the noise and that gives you a dephasing channel. And you... So OI um, is a density, is, that, is it magnetization, sigma z i, or what? Uh, yes, the noise couples in this instance to sigma zi. Thank you. Right. Then, so it's a random, it's a random on-site um, field, and so when you when you convert it into a master equation, that's a dephasing master equation, and then you evolve the dephasing master equation using TVD, and it stays good to late times because the dissipation kills the um, the entanglement, the operator growth. Cool. Thank. You. Um, okay, and so um, this is this is what you find, um, and so, so uh, shouldn't uh, the left hand uh, part of this plot come down to delta equals zero, delta d equals zero, um, and it's um, not. Yeah, it's 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 scaled in a kind of annoying way, but, but um, yeah, so it's yeah that that's right, but there's also a factor of there's also a factor of times so you've got to rescale that out. But um, yeah, so so the way this is supposed to, um, yeah, it, sh it should approach. So you're asking why it's um, non-monotonic, I guess, which it is. You can see it's non-monotonic, and that's sure, yeah, yeah. Rescaled. If it if it weren't if it weren't rescaled, what you'd find is, um, yeah, I, I really should find a version of this plot that's not rescaled. If it's not rescaled, what you find um, in terms of the parent diffusion constant is it sort of has its it has its integrable value. It's a constant at a short times, and then um, at this at this first crossover time scale, it begins to drop, and then at the second crossover time scale, it flatlines again at a, at a new value. Okay, thanks. That's that's what it's supposed to look like if it's not rescaled. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, okay, so um, so. Um, why is this subdiffusion happening? Well, I think that that just follows from this um, magnon picture. And in fact, it's sort of it's a confirmation at some level of the validity of this um, of this um, magnon depolarization perspective. Um, why does um, okay? And 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 I should and here's just a different way of plotting that data. So which I think addresses um, or sort of addresses Thomas's question. So at 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 high frequencies, the conductivity doesn't know that you've broken integrability. Then you have a crossover scale where it realizes it's broken integrability. Um, it drops in this regime, and then at asymptotically low frequencies, it, um, it, it it flatlines again. Now, an important thing to notice is that this this value, this uh, DC value of the conductivity, is independent of the noise. So the moment you break integrability, you eventually flatline to this DC value. It doesn't depend on the noise strength. Um, the reason why that's true is basically that both um, both processes. Um, okay, so what's so this process I think is straightforward to understand. It's the mean free path of the magnons. Um, so when the magnons are still when the magnons still haven't backscattered off the noise, um, the model is basically integrable, and you haven't seen any changes um, yet. Um, once you hit the mean free path, um, now you're in the subdiffusive regime where the magnons are moving diffusively. And also depolarizing, so over time they um, they carry less and less magnetization. Um, why does this crossover? Why does second crossover happen? Well, because um, at finite delta, um, you also have processes where magnons are either absorbed into bigger domains or emitted by bigger domains, and these processes are suppressed in perturbation theory at the level one over delta. But of course, the moment you break integrability the magnon conservation um, is also not a strict conservation law. And, um, and so if you um, estimate when that breaks at the level of, um, of perturbation theory, um, you find that both these scales depend the same way on gamma, 
And so the dependence on gamma, that's noise strength cancels out and you compute the asymptotic diffusion constant. So yeah, so the so there's this this I think addresses many um, old numerical puzzles um, where you did calculations that broke integrability and then tried to take the integrable limit at the end. Um, those limits don't really commute because of this because of this physics. Okay, so um, that's and so you also see this um, this subdiffusion for um, cases where. Um, um, you break integrability with Hamiltonian perturbations, but now you can't um, you can't run it out for long enough to um, you can't run it out for long enough to see um, the saturation. Fine. So um, that's that's where we are so far. So um, um, to summarize what, what we have so far, we had diffusion in the linear response limit at half filling. Um, we went away from half filling, we restored ballistic transport, but with anomalies in the local autocorrelation function that come from these big heavy strings of, of, of spins. Um, we broke um, integrability and that gave us subdiffusion because now instead of moving ballistically, the magnons are moving um, diffusively. Um, what I'm going to do last is I'm going to go away from linear response and think about um, what happens to this diffusion in, um, in, in a slightly more general transport setting. Um, the slightly more general setting is motivated by experiments that I was um, involved in understanding in Emanuel Bloch's group um, in Munich. Um, and so the idea behind these experiments is you create a spin chain um, and it's sort of sitting in the objective, it's sitting under a, a, a microscope that has single atom resolution. Um, and what this microscope can do is can take single atom um, resolved snapshots of the entire system. And so what this um, experimental procedure allows you to do is allows you to start the system out with a fixed number of particles in the left half system, a fixed number of particles in the right half system um, in the initial state. And then, and then you let the dynamics go and then you take a very large number of snapshots and you can ask um, what's the, the entire probability distribution of the number of particles that got transferred from the left half system to the right half system. And so this is called um, full counting statistics of charge transfer. And, um, and the low moments of it, the mean and the variance um, are obviously related, related at some level to transport, but the higher moments of, um, of the statistics go beyond um, just knowing what the transport is. And so one question you could ask is um, if you take um, if you take our kind of weird looking diffusions, uh, kind of a weird looking diffusive model, what does it look like away from um, the moments that correspond to linear response? So that's what um, I'm going to talk about in the last um, part of this talk. Um, and um, and so, um, to set your expectations, let me um, just present what's known for um, um, for normal diffusive systems, like say the symmetric exclusion process. Um, and so here, um, what you find is that all the moments of this distribution that I wrote down um, of of this operator, the charge that was transferred from the left to the right half chain, um, scale the same way. Um, with time, they all scale as um, a square root of time. And in fact, you can write down a generating function for all the moments um, of, um, of the charge transfer, and it's given by this um, and the expression, which is maybe not, um, the details that aren't so important. The key thing about it is that it's got this form that's square root of t times, um, times lambda times some other stuff. Question. Yeah, go ahead. Do you mean moment or cumulant? I, I, sorry, I do mean cumulants. Thanks. Okay. So um, what I now want to talk about is how this plays out in the case of um, of the um, of the XXZ spin chain in the limit of large anisotropy. And so here, once again, um, what I want to do is I want to take a domain wall that's um, so on the left half system, most of my spins are up. On the right half system, most of my spins are down, and then I have the occasional magnon um, either coming from the left or the right. If I had no magnons at all, then 
so, so, well, I guess Andrew is back. That, that, no, um, that okay. Was good. <laughs> oh, okay, fine, good. Um, so, um, you might say, okay, if the, if the domain wall is just undergoing an unbiased random walk, um, why would you have some net transfer of charge from the from the left half of the system to the right half of the system anyway? Because um, you know it seems like it's it's all linked to the way the domain is moving. Um, it turns out there's a rather subtle and um, but at the same level quite simple relation between the amount of charge transfer and the location of the domain wall. So what you find is that when the domain wall moves toward the origin, um, the charge transfer decreases. And when the domain wall moves away from the origin, the charge transfer increases in the setup. So obviously the domain wall begins at the origin. So at, at, at early times, the only thing that can happen is that the charge can, is the charge transfer can go from left to the right. But, um, but of course, over time, you can also have events where um, the domain moves back towards the origin and that's gonna make the charge transfer move back towards zero. And the charge transfer basically, um, its dynamics undergoes is, is that of a random walk with a reflecting boundary condition at the um, at the origin, and, and that's basically the absolute value of a random walk. And so, um, and so, there are two important implications of this um, of this structure. The first is that you get a very strongly skewed distribution of um, of polarization transfer because if you take half of a Gaussian, um, that's of course a very strongly skewed distribution, right? It has because it's sort of it's 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 cut off by a wall at one end and it's a Gaussian on the other side. Um, and the other thing that's um that's kind of um surprising about it is that actually um this is the dynamics of a single random walker. It's not the dynamics of an ensemble of random walkers because the only thing that's undergoing a random walk is this domain wall. And so because of that, the usual central limiting argument that tells you that um, that the variance um, and um, and the mean um, scale the same way for, say, the symmetric exclusion process completely fails here. And here, in fact, um, the, the variance scales as the square of the mean um, and, um, and the mean, the standard deviation of things that scale like. Um, and fundamentally, this is because in this system, because it's integrable, and the, the diffusion is due to the diffusion of this giant domain wall. Um, there's not a bunch of independent random walkers, just one giant random walker. Um, and, um, and so, um, right, so, so I, I was going the wrong way. Um, and so you can, you can actually um, generalize this to periodic boundary conditions, which is for some reason why, where I've done all my numerical work, and you can compute the exact um, generating function for the charge transfer distribution. It has this rather simple form and notice that instead of being instead of um instead of going as um as the square root of lambda times sorry instead of going as lambda times the square root of t it goes that whole thing um quantity squared um and um and so um this 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 is if you like um the big difference between um the generating functions you see in stochastic processes that are diffusive and the one you see in this um, strange integrable diffusion process. And yeah, this prefactor can be computed analytically using generalized hydrodynamic methods. But maybe that's not so interesting. Um, yeah, so um, so does this work? Um, well, you could try it for the XXZ spin chain and the two basic predictions for the, the mean and the standard deviation seem, sorry, the predictions of the mean, the standard deviation, the skewness seem basically right, even though um, it's a quantum spin chain, so you can't really do the numerics out to very late times. Um, a more sort of convincing numerical check of this uh, prediction comes from um, doing simulations on a classical cellular automaton that um, realizes um, the, um, the delta equals infinity limit of the XXZ spin chain. And here you can really see that, um, that the, the distribution the entire histogram um, collapses onto something that's more or less what um, the simple theory predicts and the moment scale the right way with time. Um, and, um, and okay, so um, um, one thing I should say is that this, this is a theory that I developed, that we developed for um, the limit where the magnons were dilute, but you can use generalized hydrodynamic thinking to also push this over to, um, to the limit where there are not only dilute magnons, but some finite density of magnons, and also some finite density of like 
bound states are two magnons and strings are three magnons and so on. Um, and, um, and so um, it, 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 it turns out that, um, that this universal distribution, um, this universal distribution and the scaling with time are completely general for all of these um, cases. The only thing that you really have to scale appropriately is this overall, uh, is the overall scale factor, the overall scale factor for this um, distribution. And that, that has its dependence on, on the magnetization. Um, notice the two limits. So in this, in this limit, the magnetization is complete. Um, there are no magnons, the domain wall is frozen, and so there's no um, charge transfer. Um, in the limit where there's no magnetization, well, the problem is symmetric between left and right. So of course, you're not going to transfer magnetization between left and right. And so there's, a, there's this non-monotonic um, dependence um, between those two limits. OK. Um, and, um, and so um, you can also ask what happens when you um, go to the unmagnetized state. So that's the state with magnons in it, but also an equal number of up and down domains. So in that case, obviously, there's no net magnetization transfer because, um, because the two, the left and right half of the system is statistically identical. Um, but what happens is you can, you can say there's some pattern of domain walls, some of which are up, that you have an up, then a down, then an up, then a down, and so on. And when a magnon moves to a system, it just shifts the entire pattern over by one step. And so as, as a bunch of magnons move through the system, the, this, this pattern jitters and it undergoes some kind of diffusive Brownian motion. And, um, but the pattern itself is essentially unmagnetized. And so um, after a time um, T, um, the, the sort of the typical scale of the magnetization you transfer from left to right half the system actually does scale um, in this equilibrium state um, as t to the one fourth and not t to the one half. But the moment you go away from equilibrium, the moment you create an imbalance between left and the right, um, if you wait long enough, um, you go back to this universal distribution. But the time you have to wait scales, um, it diverges rapidly as you approach um, the equilibrium um, state. Um, so that's pretty much everything I wanted to say today. Um, so um, even in systems where linear response transport is diffusive, you can, at least in some cases, have some really surprising phenomena when you go away from um, the special state and the special linear response limit. And, um, and yeah, so, um, and so you have um, subdiffusion with integrability breaking, you have anomalous exponents in a magnetic field, and your full counting statistics is very different from what you'd expect if all you knew about the system was that it was diffusive. Um, so this is all for the um, the easy access regime of the XXZ spin chain. Um, I um, I guess um, one still open question is what happens when you um, go to the Heisenberg limit um, of the model? That's when delta equals one. Um, is that still diffusive? I mean, sorry. Is, so their transport is super diffusive. But what happens to all these other phenomena? Um, and so I leave that as an open question and um, and stop now and take questions. Thank you. I'll just stop the recording. Um